Okay, when I thought about the concept of covering Quantic Dream's games, I only had two things in mind. Explore the meme that is the creator of these games, and see if his titles are really that bad. And two, I like to play games that try to stand out from the background and do something unique, or at least try to. This curiosity has always fueled my choices in which game I want to play and cover for this channel. And while it can fall flat on its face quite a few times, it is never boring. Well, for me anyway. And to let you in on my process, my brain works on a simple algorithm that the worst games in my eyes are the ones that are boring or do nothing to push the proverbial boat out. Ah, shit, I'm stalling. Okay, Heavy Rain is a very, very bad game. And while it's a testament to everything wrong with David Cage and his approach to storytelling, it's a fascinating mess that needs to be pulled apart and examined. And now we have that all established, welcome to part 2 of the David cage -a -thon. All around me are familiar faces, worn out. We start this sordid tale in the silk boxer shorts of Ethan Mars, a doting family man and architect, waking up in his lavish home in whatever town USA. After a shit shave and shower, he bums around the house trying to find the motivation to do some drawing, in a sequence that is more relatable than I want to admit. This silence is quickly broken when Ethan's wife, who looks like she was rendered on a Sega Saturn, comes home from shopping with his sons, Jason and Sean, who also look like they've been rendered on graphics APIs from the early 2000s. After kicking Jason's ass in a sword fight and getting some dinner plates from the front room cupboard, I wonder if David Cage knows how dining rooms work. I actually forget that shit because Ethan discovers that Sean's pet bird has bitten the dust. And I bet you're wondering, does this mean anything? Will this bird play a major factor in the story? Nope. The following day, the Mars family hit the mall to buy some more stuff because they haven't got enough fucking decadence already, and Ethan and Jason decide to bum around and spend some quality time together, until Jason finds a creepy looking clown selling balloons and goads his dad to get him one. A red balloon, I might add. I guess they all float down here. And this is where the first cracks of stupidity make themselves known, because as soon as Jason receives this gift, his character loses most of his IQ points and just wanders off on his own, leaving Ethan to, yes, press X to repeatedly scream his son's name like a glitched text-to-speech program. And <laughs> I don't know about you, but if you are working an orchestra's tits off to build the tension, making the player scream Jason! every 15 nanoseconds somewhat undercuts this mood. I will say that the memes were pretty good though. Anyway, Ethan finds his dumbass son across the road from the mall, and after shouting at him again using the holy button prompt, Jason decides to run across the road without looking at the car that's in his direct path. So in an act of daddy heroism, Ethan tries to dive towards his son to save him. And then two years have passed and everything is sad and depressing and whoa, 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 whoa. Wait for a second, Space Cowboy. What just happened? Let's roll it back and take a look at that footage again. Okay, so Ethan grabs his boy and turns him away from the car. At the same time, the driver was already braking hard. And while you don't see the impact, the worst case scenario here is that Ethan should be more hurt than his son. Maybe some bruising, cuts, perhaps some broken bones, brain damage? But dead? Nah mate, I ain't buying it. Now, if Jason went under the wheels, then maybe he's dead, but I'm overthinking this load of mierda. The real reason why Jason has to die is that David Cage needs a plot device, goddammit, no matter how implausible, a theme that will show its head again very shortly. Right, so like I said before, two years have passed and Ethan and his wife have split up over the tragedy, and now he's living in a dingy house with his remaining son, Sean, who are both suffering from the grief of losing Jason. At least there isn't that meter gauging their mental state like in Fahrenheit. Alright, I didn't bring this up in the review, but I think you realise how dumb this mechanic is. While I respect that Cage is trying to be more realistic in his approach, such as this little part here where Ethan breaks down, which did hit me on a micro emo level, the reason why this moment fails to capture the mood is because how Jason passed away and how contrived it was. Plus, the voice acting that is supposed to portray this sadness, especially from Sean, doesn't fit the tone. Come on, Sean. It's time for bed. 
Oh, but I never go to bed this early. No, you're going to bed now. It won't do you any harm to go to bed early for you're once. You're mean! You just want me to get out of the way so you can have some peace! I hate you! Hello, fellow human! I am also a fellow human! So after this long intro and this needless child death, what is the actual story of Heavy Rain? Well, to break it down, you play as four main characters who are on the hunt for the origami killer. The story actually begins when Ethan is on a day out with his remaining beautiful baby robot, who manages to vanish into thin air because David Cage needs another pissing plot device. <laughs> Uh, no. The story is structured in a Tarantino-esque affair, where we jump from one protag to another in what Cage quips as a non-linear story, not grasping the fact that his story is very linear. And while you can change the outcome in a very small way, to the detriment of the plot most of the time, the outcome is still the same. The other main characters, apart from Ethan, you get to control are Madison Page. Her whole presence is so inconsequential to the entire plot, she could have been easily cut and no one would have noticed. Madison is just a waifu Cage fawns over for the whole pissing game, and her whole character arc could be boiled down to being assaulted multiple times. One of these being in a dream, which is totally necessary. And yes, boning the lead protagonist because DC's OC needs to get laid. Again. Also, in a creepy act of continuity, Madison is introduced in the same white tank top and panties that Clara was wearing in the last game. For fuck's sake, Cage, you're married, knock it off. Also, her first interaction with Ethan is really jarring. She just finds him at a random motel, all banged up. So, being the good person she is, she nurses him back to health under the guise that she's just being nice. Which is a very poor way of making these characters meet, because her actual motivation is to cozy up to him and find out if he is the origami killer, because she is a reporter. But we don't know her actual intentions or her vocation until later on, so her implementation in this story comes off as fucking clumsy. FBI agent Norman Jaden, who is Horatio Kane with all the charms sand blasted off, who also uses these CSI cyber shades, say that three times fast, to look for clues that mean nothing to the overall investigation. Also, I don't think our intrepid auteur knows that the FBI usually investigate white collar crime. Yeah, they will investigate serial killers, but that's not their priority. I will say this, however, his gameplay is pretty cool, and it'd be a great little spin off on its own. And lastly, we have Scott Shelby, a cop turned private eye who is investigating the murders for reasons. Also, he suffers from asthma, a point that is established very early on into the story, but it doesn't seem to hinder him beating the piss out of everyone that comes in his path, such as this frankly hilarious scene where a shopkeeper is being held at gunpoint. So of course, Shelby John wicks him into a coma, but in a funny continuity botch, he forgets to disarm this bloke. Yep, he just proceeds to stand there yapping to the shopkeeper while an armed thug is three feet away. Did he die? Or did Shelby hit him so hard he disappeared off the face of the earth? And I thought Lucas Kane was wearing some thick plot armor. And the story just goes along at its own languid pace, where you jump from one avatar to another. And to be honest, most of this stuff is aggravating to witness from a gameplay perspective, which can only be described as restrictive and tedious and most levels consist of a singular character bumming around doing nothing of note. For the sake of brevity, from now on, I'll only comment on the bits that are relevant to the real story, rather than covering the Silent Hill downpour of bollocks, because there's a lot of shit in this game that goes nowhere and it's a giant waste of time, so let's get a move on. After Sean gets abducted in a scene that is more confusing than intriguing, Ethan is contacted by the origami killer and is given a series of challenges to uncover the location of his son, who is currently being held in a storm drain, and with this constant rain, has only three days to survive. Even though he would probably die of hypothermia or complications due to exhaustion, but you know David Cage, he doesn't care for subtleties or logic, tension, world and character building, I could go on. Such as this idea, which is a blatant copy of the gore porn shite fest, Saw. Yeah, it's a one-to-one -one lift of the material, and while the traps that Ethan has to go through are very PG-13, 
The self-righteous antagonist punishing the person who is stuck in their deadly trials is still there. I would elaborate, but it would take effort, and David Cage can only muster a couple of keyboard shortcuts. To compress a ton of info into a bite-sized chunk, Heavy Rain was influenced by movies like Seven and Memento, both for being gritty thrillers and for their distinctive, desaturated look. While Heavy Rain was made in the era where colours in gaming were banned, because the lizard people that run this fucking industry can only see three shades of grey, like E.L. James with colour blindness, I can forgive this choice in aesthetic because it does fit the mood, if you can ignore the permanent rainfall nearly every scene, which I know I am aware the title of the game and its significance with the wet stuff, but it can come off as a tad goofy at times. Just like the faces. Now, when the game came out over a decade ago, it was considered next gen at the time, and within this context, it looks like a typical first party Sony affair, of pushing the graphics over everything else. The thing is, I'm playing this game on what is supposed to be the enhanced port on the PC, which is also available on the PS4, and the lower resolution imperfections that may have been missed in its native platform come into full view now. And that's a nice way of saying it looks like a fucking nightmare. Granted, what I'm about to get into isn't the game's fault, well, not fully anyway. You see, I suffer from the uncanny valley, and while it's not a flat-out phobia that is still being debated by experts, it was a phenomenon that was documented in the 1970s by a roboticist Masahiro Mori. He concluded that a robot with some big eyes or vaguely human characteristics looked cute, and the people who saw these robots went away with a positive reaction. However, the further he made his robots to look more human, with realistic hair, eyes and skin, the test subjects would grow repulsed by the being that looked natural but acted unnaturally. Until the lines between man and machine were so close, the reaction of the test subjects went back to a neutral state, which is known as the valley. But for the sake of getting to the cock in point, this uncomfortable feeling would hit me harder when the parallel between photorealism and artificiality smashed into each other, especially when games were trying to be photorealistic in an age where this look was still slightly out of reach, especially in the time between the mid to late 2000s. And as you can see, David Cage and his team went full realism on Heavy Rain, and it makes my skin crawl. Now, on a surface level, I will give it to Quantic Dream for how much attention to detail they put into these faces of the main cast. Every wrinkle, hair and skin pigment looks great. My biggest complaint with the presentation and where my brain lights up like a fucking Christmas tree, it's how uneven the cast looks in the rest of the game, especially the supporting actors. Let's go back to Ethan's wife for a second. And as you can see, there is a big difference between Ethan's face in comparison to... Holy shit, she is so insignificant to the story I've forgotten her name. Whatever. What I'm trying to say is her face looks like a placeholder texture that wasn't fully fleshed out, pardon the pun. And when you see Ethan and Igor embrace, one of them looks kind of real, while the other makes my brain go. And its varying levels of production value makes this reaction even worse. Take another example, the loading screens. Like I said, great texture work, even though it's skin deep. My complaint here is why do you have to have the faces so close to the player? I really don't want to see Ethan's nose hair, and I definitely don't need to see a close-up on Sean, who looks like a polygonal bowel movement. Yes, this is a cheap way of the developers showing you how good their characters look, but their movements betray the realism. Because no one does this, no one moves their head and eyes like this, unless they're stressed out or nervous, or squirming in their seat because how fucking uncanny they look, like me. What I find ironic is that the future games in the K-geography never go this hard to push a realistic aesthetic, and in my opinion, it looks so much better. Well, mostly. This uncanny problem also shines a light on the disconnect between the polygons you see on screen and the real-life performances we hear. Going back to the subject of the actors, in my initial take of the performances, they just reeked of David Cage employing some thespians from a local amateur dramatics group and threw him in this cast with reckless abandon. Nope. In fact, I was surprised who was in this production. While the main actors in this game don't have the Hollywood level of star power, all of them do have extensive rap sheets in terms of work. And while picking through the interviews, demo reels, and behind the scenes footage for clues, you can see that most of them can act. So the problem here is, how do we go from this? 
N not a day goes by that I, I don't see his face. <laughs> now, Sean has got nothing to do with that, no, nor do any of the other children. I, this has to stop. You've got to hand yourself into the police. Look, if, if I hand myself into the police, I lose all chances of finding Sean. They'll question me, but, but I won't be able to tell them anything because I don't know anything. To this. Ethan, are you all right? I failed the trial. I was supposed to kill a man. I couldn't do it. You're not the origami killer, Ethan. You're not responsible. Oh my god, I am so bored! Ah! Is it me, or do these performances sound better than the final product? It feels like most of the lines in the game were taken from a table read rather than the final edited VO, and they took takes that range from Sleeping Pills to Cringeville, Tennessee. And it also highlights one of the biggest problems with Heavy Rain, the script. It's dull and lifeless and flat out embarrassing at times. I'll see you again, asshole. Are you alright? <laughs> <laughs> Are you all right? Sorry about the mess. After all the action, are you all right? Yeah. <laughs> Bad. Oh fuck me! With a constant use of cinematic cliches, coupled with a supporting cast that is predominantly French, you end up with this chasm between the main cast and actors who are trying their best, but are hindered by the other actors not performing in their primary tongue. So you get more performances like this. Come back when your fucking mother comes home from work. He's drunk again. What are we gonna do? It's pouring rain. We're gonna get soaked if we spend a day outside. Hello, fellow human. I am also a fellow human. And speaking of amateur, one thing I want to say about the sound design before we move on is that it's non-existent. Yes, there is music and sounds and people talking, but there was many a times when I'm playing this game and I'm having a really emotive moment. The pianos and the strings are playing. And then when you leave the room... I'm gonna go find something to eat. Wait for me, I'll, I'll be back in 10 minutes. Way to break my immersion. I'm really, really invested right now. All around me are familiar faces, worn out. As you may have guessed, that most of the story within Heavy Rain, especially between the intro and what we're about to dive into, is mostly inconsequential. And while there are some shocking moments, the rest is filled with fluff that within the context of this overall narrative does not go anywhere. And it's now time to unmask the biggest fish in this pond, who is the Origami Killer, who is the twisted twat that orchestrated this spree of brutality. A person that's been operating in the shadows to make all the players in this deadly game bend to his will. Yes, the Origami Killer is Private Detective Scott Shelby. What? What the fuck? Right, before I start going all content cop on this twist, I will say that I do like the idea of Shelby being the killer. I mean, what is more chilling than a person who swore an oath to protect and serve being the one who wants to cause you harm? It's a smart move that plays with the expectations of the player, just like me front-loading this paragraph with praise, because it will be shortly followed up with me talking shit about it. Ooh, what a twist. Oh my god. Within the context of Heavy Rain, Shelby being the killer and the reasons leading up to this reveal are nonsensical, lazy, and require so many leaps in logic, I question why they went for it in the finished product. Video games take a long time to produce and have hundreds of pairs of eyes looking at every aspect of the production. They are bespoke, measured works of craftsmanship that take a lot of time and effort to produce. If you ignore the exploitative, half-baked shite you see on Steam. And I know the team at Quantic are drinking the Cage Kool-Aid. Oh yeah! 
but couldn't one of them put their hand up and question why this twist is so poorly executed? The reason why I raise this question is because certain events that apparently transpire when the reveal takes place are not only sloppy, but some are flat out lies. There is a scene midway through the game where an envelope is given to Shelby by a woman called Lauren, who is a side character that tags along with Scott during his investigation, like a very obedient robot. Maybe you better stay in the car. We're partners, remember? Wherever you go, I go. Hello, fellow human. I am also a fellow human. Anyway, Lauren is one of the mothers affected by the origami killer. So this said envelope that she gives to Shelby has her address and her husband's name on it, which was sent the day her son was kidnapped. Shelby then discovers that the address on the envelope was made by a very specific typewriter, which looks very similar to the same make and model that's on Shelby's desk right now. Hmm, interesting. Which leads to a clip where we have a chat with the local typewriter repairman called Manfred. After some tasteful fast forwarding, Shelby discovers Manfred is dead. Oh my god. He's dead. Okay, I'll give it to Cage, that was a shocking turn. The thing is, when the twist happens at the end of the game, there is a little scene that shows Shelby bludgeoning this poor guy to death. And I have to say, I gasped, not because this poor bastard met a very grisly end, no, by how dumb it is. In fact, I was shocked to see this amount of incompetence in terms of editing and scripting, I honestly thought it was a glitch. So I went and checked other gameplay videos on YouTube, and no, this is how the scene plays out in all versions. The thing is, when you're actually playing this scene in the context of the whole story, the way Shelby had to kill Manfred was in a time frame so small he had to either be using speed hacks or no clip, because it just doesn't add up. Let's analyse this scene. Right, so this shot consists of Shelby, Manfred and Lauren. You see Manfred goes off into the back room to get this thing for the investigation. And then it's followed by this 14 second cutaway where we don't see Shelby. And yes, I timed it. In this 14 seconds, you see Lauren malfunctioning, trying to run her human.exe file, and getting a nice zooming on that ballerina dancing thing that every new metal music video had in the early 2000s. And then it cuts back to Shelby. But then when you line these two scenes up together, you can see where Shelby kills Manfred and it takes about 20 seconds to do the whole thing. Yes, I am fully aware I'm being incredibly pedantic about this. And you could argue this is just artistic expression and not to be taken literally. But may I remind you, this whole thing was to cover up the envelope that Lauren gave Shelby that could expose him as the origami killer which makes this whole sequence smell of convoluted bullshit and also a writer writing in a stream of consciousness. He's just going on and on, but he's not thinking about where it's going. Because the easy way out of this whole scenario was for Shelby to club Lauren to death like a French baby seal, because she has no family or friends that we know of, so they wouldn't spot her being missing if she disappeared. And let's be honest, it would be a great service to mankind to stop the cyborg menace before they take over the Earth. And furthermore, and more critically, she has nothing to do with this story. This whole part of the game is superfluous. You could have got rid of it and it wouldn't have affected the story at all. It would have been just gone and we could have moved on with our lives. And this is just a little example of one of the many reasons why Heavy Rain just does nothing for me. And while it's the height of hubris to think that I would have a better way of writing this story, it does bring into focus what the fuck was David Cage doing, apart from making a 2000 page manuscript for r slash brain cells. All around me are familiar faces, worn out. Right, so after this little break just to calm down, it's now time to pick apart the finale, or 17 of them. Alright, I'm joking, we're only going to do a few because most of them don't fucking matter, but <laughs> let's get on with it. After getting four different endings, yes, I played this game three more times than I would have cared for, there was a shared feeling across all four of these playthroughs. They were all deeply unsatisfying. And no, I'm not one of those annoying dicks that think everything has to end on a good note. Hell, some of my favourite games have down or ambiguous endings, because what is a better tool than using your own imagination to come up with a worthwhile conclusion? Well, until you bring out a sequel that cocks the ambiguity up, am I right, lads? <laughs> Sorry. 
When it comes to heavy rain, these resolutions come from another angle. Most of them are either saccharine or baffling. And the only finale with any kind of payoff is the one where Lauren kills Shelby. The problem here is that this resolution is apparently a bad ending. Let me reiterate, the ending where a sadistic killer gets his comeuppance by a woman whose child died that is also fueled by the other families that have been tormented by this sick twat is only unlocked if you play the game incorrectly. All you did was collect the evidence you've left behind. Wipe out your past and feed on the misery of the parents whose children you've killed. I swore on my son's grave that I would kill the man who murdered him. I'm gonna keep my word. But this isn't the worst thing Heavy Rain has to offer. After 10 hours of this bollocks, what is the link between Scott the origami killer Shelby and Ethan the best dad five ever Mars? You know, the emotional core of this entire story. The thing that is supposed to keep us engaged, to keep us on the edge of our seats. The link is, my little cheeky breaky, is this. Who are you? Oh, you don't know me, Ethan. Oh, but we've met before. The only thing that ties the main characters is a contrived edit that Shelby saw Ethan at the mall when his son died. And that was the spark to put him through the gauntlet of piss weak saw traps to prove his daddy dom traits. Okay, I can give it a little leeway because we saw Shelby in the opening act and it would have blown his cover instantly. But this reveal comes off as so fucking cheap. And to pull another example of how you can do this twist really well is Spec Ops The Line. And while it shares the same twist, you are playing from a character that is hallucinating this whole story. And when you realize it's a figment of his imagination, all the pieces of the puzzle that didn't really make any sense fall into place. Also, it's careful use of symbolism and surrealism play directly into this reveal. And I hate to spoil it for this video because we're talking about fucking heavy rain, but it's a perfect example of how to use this twist in a really effective way. But instead of screaming my tits off about this, here is some more fan fiction for you. Okay, how cool would it have been if Jason died and the cops put the blame on Ethan for causing his son's death, either by negligence or manslaughter, which then caused Ethan to do a couple of years in the clink for a crime he didn't commit. And then when he finally gets out and ends up living in a shitty flat or depressed and stuff, he then gets a call from his ex-wife or a letter saying that his remaining son has been kidnapped. And because he doesn't trust the cops, he reaches out to Shelby and Madison to help him investigate. And then you can have Maddie doing the seduction thing and getting her tits out, blah, blah, blah. And then you have the private investigator who's taking great pleasure passively tormenting our lead with all that sore shit. And then when the reveal happens, you have an emotional investment in this trio of characters. Ergo, making a very satisfying conclusion. Well, in my eyes anyway. Also, please, Mr. Cage, I need a job. Please. And now I have a twist for you. This is why I did a long bloated description of the intro. Because this is just a microcosm of everything wrong with Heavy Rain. Press X to Jason. Press X to Sean. It's a cheap and poor excuse of trying to push emotive moments into something we haven't built any feelings for. David Cage is so adamant he wants you to feel for his characters, but he does it in such a way that doesn't deserve or warrant your affection, because we haven't built any attachment to them in either length of time or just general investment. And what makes it more baffling is he treats emotions like they're a template you can drop into your games and then boom, there you go. Here is your new favorite character, love them. 
It just doesn't work that way. And he's just generally missing the wood for the trees because any game, regardless of genre, can stir your feelings in multiple different ways without the developers telling you how to feel. And that's the thing. The artificiality of everything in Heavy Rain absolutely kills the immersion for me. This is a fake world with fictional entities born to do the bidding of the storyteller who fundamentally doesn't get humanity and more importantly, has no clue about drama. Who treats the interactivity of his said games to be a bad thing and treat you like you cannot be trusted to behave accordingly. Ethan did not cut his finger off to prove he is a worthy father. You were forced to do it because you had to, because if you didn't, the story would end right there and there'd be no resolution. This wasn't made for people who wanted to escape the mundanity of life. This was a shallow attempt at Oscar bait, of stealing concepts from another medium to try and grab the golden joysticks and other phallic symbols made out of precious metals. This, my friends, is the anti-video game, where nothing has meaning. It's an existential void that will suck out your soul and make you hate the one thing you truly love in life. Not even natural selection can take place here. The world is being engulfed in truth. And this is the way the world of video games ends. Not with a bang, but a whimper. Wait, no, this can't be right. I love video games. Why am I being like this? There must be something in Heavy Rain that is satisfying or decent. Something that we can stop bitching about. Oh, the good ending. Surely that must be some sort of redeemable quality inside. It can't be all fucking trash. Nope. <sighs> okay. Ethan and Madison put the past behind them and start a new life together. But, excuse me, huh. this doesn't make any cocking sense because Madison only went to Ethan because she thought he was the origami killer. Which means those two getting together after this whole sordid fucking scenario makes Ethan look like a complete and total... FBI agent Norman Jaden, remember him, becomes a guest on a talk show and then flushes his viral cyber smack down the toilet because not only he's a member of the bureau, he was also a drug addict and this said drug kept him from going cyber mad when he was in VR. <laughs> And Lauren spits on Shelby's grave because the better ending of this whole fucking game was locked behind playing the game incorrectly. And yes, I know vigilantism is bad, truth and justice and all that bollocks, but this bloke is a deranged serial killer that would most probably die for his crimes if he was convicted. So going to Frank Castle on this bitch is justified. Nah, bollocks that. Let the least important character have a fist fight on top of a garbage disposal machine, which ends in the origami killer falling to his death because the writer couldn't see that he had a decent finale so he had to conjure up some empty spectacle to be more palatable for this type of resolution i don't fucking know and fuck me with a fish fork that is the end of this game and sodomize me with several more kitchen utensils that was one of the worst games i have ever played and i know that's very cliche to say but fuck you this is rock bottom Look, I'm not here to shit on people who enjoy this game. If you unironically love it, then all the power to you. And I can totally get why people liked it, especially at the time of its release. I can also respect Quantic's push for emotive storytelling in an industry that really didn't emphasize this type of narrative. But shit on a shepherd's sheepdog, going back to play Heavy Rain 10 years later, was a dull and irritating slog that doesn't seem to end or shut the fuck up. Which sucks because I love the world and the actors playing these characters are fucking great at their job. And it sucks because I have fallen in love with games like this before, like L.A. Noir, And that is one of my favourite games of all time. And while it was cathartic to riff on Heavy Rain in video form, it was also a very depressing game to play. And what makes it frustrating is that I can see the nuggets of greatness stuck in the miasma of underbaked ideas and bloat because David Cage doesn't know when to stop and he thinks that more means a better product. No, less is more. If you polish a few decent ideas, then you might have a fighting chance to create something memorable. But no, you threw in more sloppy unrefined ideas that not only impede the flow of the game, but push its narrative beyond breaking point. Perhaps it was a loss in translation and perhaps he was in need of an editor or a writing mentor. I don't know. And I don't fucking care. And with all that said, 
The only accolade I can give David Cage for Heavy Rain, the only glowing star next to his name, is that he managed to create a thriller that is not thrilling.